This is a lecture on Rousseau and Kant and their uh, joint uh, efforts to, well, it's conducted separ separately, of course, to construe a kind of an idea of, of perpetual peace or eternal peace. Kant wrote a prominent essay called To Eternal Peace, uh, sometimes it's translated uh, uh, as to perpetual peace. Uh, but it means the same thing, this idea of a, a teleological idea, telos being an end, a goal of, of, of reaching a place where the conflicts that, that beset us, war, for instance, would uh, po possibly cease and there would effectively be a kind of an end of history. So um, in, in our lecture today, so far in the lectures preceding this on uh, Descartes and the British empiricism and Locke and Plato and so on, have been uh, geared towards building a uh, an understanding of different of different epistemological orientations or different ways of of knowing uh, the world, and uh, we are going to also be talking about uh, Kantian, Hegelian, Marxian uh, dialectics as well, and a different kind of epistemology that emerges in these systems. Uh, but the, this uh, lecture today is geared towards moving towards a thinking, uh, a more sort of political uh, thinking and, and applying some of these concepts in a more uh, overtly political uh, manner, because what we're doing in this series of lectures is also uh, trying to look, explore intersections of uh, deconstruction and, uh, and, and Marxism and, and political thought and how these ideas are applied uh, you know, politically. Um, so um, we're going to also, in doing this, we'll take a little bit of time and review concepts of, of justice in uh, among these various thinkers that we're going to be uh, reading uh, this quarter. And, uh, and also uh, we'll have a look at Rousseau's very uh, important essay, The Social Contract, which, which is uh, Kant's point of departure in his uh, To Eternal Peace, which becomes effectively the uh, the, 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 doc, the document that inaugurates the, uh, the very idea of, of a United Nations that we have today, which is formerly at one time uh, the Kantian League and it evolved into the League of Nations and it became the, uh, the United Nations. But a lot of this comes out of Rousseau's, excuse me, a Kant's uh, To Eternal Peace, which, which in, its part, in its turn comes out of uh, Rousseau's uh, social contract. So if effectively, uh, Kant is building upon Rousseau's ideas articulated in the social contract. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll look at this uh, also with the goal of down the road, uh, when we read Spectres of Marx, uh, understanding De uh, Derrida's deconstruction of teleological progressive thinkers like uh, you know, uh, Marx and, uh, and Hegel, also uh, Fukuyama, who wrote this uh, book that was influential in the early 90s called The End of History and the Last Men. So we're beginning to move towards also thinking of, 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 of the end of history and asking the question, what is progress? What does it mean to be a progressive thinker? Uh, now, these terms are often reflexively assumed today. I mean, for instance, in contemporary political debate uh, on, on the left in the United States, uh, there's, you know, this question of like, for instance, the supporters of Bernie Sanders describe themselves as progressive, um, as opposed to more, say, centrist uh, Democrats like the current possible, you know, uh, uh, presidential uh, candidate for the Democrats, Joe Biden, who's a more centrist Democrat, as opposed to more progressive Democrat like, uh, like Bernie, Bernie Sanders. But the question uh, uh, is often begged, what exactly does it mean to be a progressive. And this is something that we're going to also explore in, uh, in today's uh, lecture. So again, I've entitled the, essay, or the lecture uh, Rousseau, Kant, and Eternal Peace. Uh, that's a little uh, drawing by Picasso, one of my favorite painters there in the middle. Uh, there, that's not on the far right. That's not uh, Smeagol. That is uh, uh, Immanuel Kant. And then on the far left is, is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who we'll be discussing as well. Um, okay, um, so let's start uh, with a, a discussion of Rousseau, who precedes Kant and, 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 who, and who is a great inspiration to Kant. In fact, it's said that, uh, that, that Kant uh, kept a picture, a portrait of Rousseau 
in his house. And, and really, I, I think that, uh, that, that if you read Rousseau before you come to Kant, Kant's going to be a lot easier to read because Kant is very uh, is, is notoriously difficult to read, and there's a there's a kind of a an intellectual precision, a conceptual precision uh, in the thinking of Kant. Uh, Rousseau is not as precise, and yet uh, many of the ideas of Kant are are uh, effectively conceptual retoolings of what we find in Rousseau, and Kant, you know, uh, acknowledged his indebtedness to Rousseau. Now Rousseau was was a kind of a strange fellow. Uh, he, he he was kind of a bizarre guy, but he he uh, uh, nonetheless uh, wrote some amazing works of philosophy that were very influential uh, in his day and that remain enormously influential in our time as well. And so he's he's most certainly uh, somebody who's who's worth reading and getting to know uh, pretty well. And uh, the, the, his, one of his earlier works is the Discourse on Inequality. Uh, the Social Contract, which we're going to be studying, is, is, is a more uh, mature work. And uh, it, it lays the foundation for, uh, for a thinking, a Republican uh, ideology, a thinking of the Republic that is, uh, uh, that, that is quite complex and, and, and very fascinating in its own way. Um, and, and like, as I, as I said about Descartes' uh, discourse on method, the social contract, it's, it's not a very long book, but there's, there's, there's a great deal of, uh, that's in it, and it's, and it's, worth, it's worth kind of unpacking in the same way that we unpacked uh, Descartes' discourse on method. How much uh, we, we have to, of course, go quickly because we've got a lot to cover, but I'll try in this, in this uh, presentation today to go to, to identify some of these key concepts. Um, we won't be able to discuss all of it, however. Um, now, other texts, Emile is a text on education, very interesting text, very influential text. Like John Locke, uh, Rousseau was very influential in his uh, thinking about education. Uh, for instance, his thinking about childhood um, and, uh, you know, as a time of kind of natural innocence. And he, he, this contributed to really to a, a wide ranging rethinking of, of the educational philosophy in his day. Um, and uh, Confessions, very, very uh, noteworthy book. Get, you get a kind of a sense of, of this kind of weirdness that uh, uh, Rousseau, I mean, I'll give you just one instance, like he describes how, I think he, he, he and this woman that he lived with who we called mama or mother, um, I think that's what also our vice president Pence calls his wife mother, uh, but he, he called her mother. And, but anyway, they, they had, uh, I think five or six children, a number of children. And every time they had a a new baby, they would just drop it off at the orphanage, which is sort of strange when you consider how influential his thinking was regarding uh, education. Uh, but it's it's a it's a fun book to read, and it gives you a sense of his uh, his, his his real his he was a true genius, I would say. Uh, he was also a musical composer. So he was he was a uh, did, did a lot of things. Um, okay, um, but but we're going to be interested in addition to. Um, uh, the, you know, uh, Rousseau's social contract. He wrote prior to Kant, as you can see there, he wrote a, a little essay called Judgment on St. Pierre's Project for Perpetual Peace in 1761. This was uh, some more than 30 years before Kant wrote his Towards Eternal Peace. And so Kant is clearly responding not only to Rousseau's social contract, but also towards uh uh, he's responding to, to, to Rousseau's thinking on this project of perpetual peace that Rousseau took very uh, seriously. Okay, um, all right. But before we, uh, before we go too deeply into, the, into Kant, either, either Rousseau's uh, social contract or Kant's uh, towards eternal peace, I want to stop again because remember, we're, we're studying these texts because they're worthy of study in their own right. However, uh, we also are, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, to, to uh, understand why they're important for uh, an understanding of deconstruction. So I want to kind of survey what some of these other, uh, what, what, what deconstructive thinkers like uh, Heidegger and Derrida, uh, whom we're going to be reading later, are going to say about questions of justice, 
which is linked to the idea of, of the social contract and, and, and hospitality, which is going to become a very important idea in Kant's towards eternal peace, this idea of hospitality, which for Kant is going to be the, the most important universal uh, human right, which becomes effectively the basis of international uh, law, which is based in this idea of hospitality. Um, and so uh, uh, we find in Heidegger, we find in Derrida, we find in Levinas, we find in many uh, post-structuralist uh, thinkers, thinkers often commonly thought of as deconstructive, uh, a, a, a profound uh, reconsideration of this question of hospitality, which is at the heart of, of Kant's uh, uh, to eternal peace. And so the question is, you know, if, if hospitality is, is a universal human right, what is hospitality? Um, what does it mean? And, uh, and how is this linked to the idea of the social contract? So this is something that we're going to uh, explore as well. So I'd like to start by comparing and contrasting some different ideas about justice. Uh, we'll start by looking at justice and the thought of Chomsky, whom we've also been reading. And then we'll look at, at, at what a uh, Heideggerian definition of justice is, a more kind of what, uh, put it in quotes, but existential definition of justice. And then, and then Derrida's definition of justice uh, as well. Okay, so here is uh, Chomsky on morality and justice. Now, uh, this is from, uh, you can read this uh, in his book, Understanding Power. But here's a quote from him, which may seem familiar to those of you who have already heard the lecture on uh, Cartesian linguistics and the animal that we discussed previously. And Chomsky and neo-Cartesian Chomsky and views of language and universal grammar. So here's what Chomsky says about moral, moral the fundamental principles of moral judgment. He says, we, we really don't know what the fundamental principles of moral judgment actually are, uh, in italics there, but we, ha but we have pretty good, a very good reason to believe that they're there. Okay, uh, interesting to note there, this, this is what we saw this kind of same gesture in Descartes. Um, we, we found in Descartes, he really doesn't know what it means to be a rational uh, uh, animal. We don't know what reason really is, and yet we can be sure that the is is. This is the same kind of gesture. So, so uh, uh, say, as with the, these uh, geometrical, uh, you know, ideas that, that, that are in our head or or that, that are implanted in our head with the soul that God, you know, put there. So Chomsky's saying something very uh, similar. We don't know what the fundamental principles of moral judgment actually are, but we can be sure that they are there. They are that we've never seen them, but uh, we don't know uh, if they're. We don't know what they are exactly, but that, but there is a there there. It is it is what it is to speak tautologically. Okay. Um, and that's simply because we can, in fact, make relatively consistent moral judgments, which are understood by other people. Uh, we can think of this as moral competence uh, and appreciated by them, sometimes with disagreement, in which case we can have moral discourse. And we can do all that under new conditions we've never seen before. Okay, there's, a, again, he's thinking of, re, of recursion there. Uh, but replied to these, these, these fundamental moral principles. And facing new problems and so on. Okay, unless we're angels, the structures that perform those functions got into the organism the same way other complex ideas did. Namely, they're largely part of a genetically determined framework, which gets modified through the course of early experience. All right, so here we have, in, in the same way, there's a basic comparison being made here between what he calls UG, universal grammar, which he says is, is a kind of a writing that is inscribed in the genome, which he sometimes also likes to compare to alphabetic letterpress uh, type that is, is written in the genome. And so now he's, he's making the same uh, move, the same gesture of describing the fundamental principles of uh, moral uh, of morality as being inscribed in, in, a, in, a, in a genome, in a, in a genetic sense, being written there uh, in, our, in our moral uh, DNA. So how much variation can there be in such moral systems? Well, without understanding, we don't know. I mean, in the case of languages, we know that it's not much variation. And in the case of moral values, I think we can make a fair guess that it also can't, uh, there also can't be much variation. And the reason for this is quite elementary. 
our moral system appears to be complex and determinate, and there are only two factors that can enter into determining it. One is our fixed biological nature, and the other is individual uh, experience. Okay, so we've we've seen all this before. We know, you know, we know we know wh where he's going with this. He's he's speaking, of course, uh, uh, as as a matter of conjecture. Um, he's he's throwing out ideas here, uh, but he's he's essentially saying, you know, what is or like we say, well, what is justice? What is what what's what is morality? It's something that is uh, that that exists here as an organ uh, in the head, in the brain. Uh, but it's a hypothetical organ because it's never been, uh, it's, 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 he's, this is a thesis he's, he's throwing out, uh, very similar to universal grammar, which has also never been uh, viewed or can't, uh, doesn't position itself empirically into the framework of knowledge. It's, it's a hypothesis that he's advancing. And that's what morality is. You know, we're going to get a very different, uh, uh, and let's say if, if you're a moral person, more, being moral and a moral act would be akin to an, a, a competent act, an act of competent speaking. Uh, the, a, a moral act would be, there, there would be a, such a thing as a morality that could be calculated, a morality uh, that would be a, a correct form of behavior, a proper and appropriate form of behavior, because it would be a matter of, of a correct representation of an organic uh, entity in your head and, 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 the, and much like the epiphenomenon that you speak, the moral act that you perform would correctly represent this uh, structure that, that Chomsky uh, claims is in the, uh, uh, lodged in the, in the genome in your brain. Okay, let's now compare Heidegger. Uh, now this is, he's reading here, this is from a, a very famous essay called The Animex Act and Her Fragment, uh, written in 1950 on the question of justice. Uh, from the Greek DK, which he's going to translate as jointedness or being in joint. Now, the, the, as we're going to see, the language here is a bit tortuous, but I'll try to uh, unpack it for you as we go through this. But I, I, I'm reading it as I, I, I almost didn't uh, include this, but I'm, I want to read it for you. Uh, and the reason why is because it will become so influential. Uh, uh, and, and thinkers to follow Heidegger. And so although figures like Levinas, Derrida, uh, Spivak, and many others are going to, um, you know, uh, criticize the Heideggerian articulation of justice, they're going to do so from a perspective of building upon it. Okay, and what I, what I mean by that is what all of these concepts of justice um, have in common and how they come at, how, they, how they're influenced by Heidegger is that all of them are again again i'm putting this in quotes existential uh, uh, concepts of justice you know which means they're a matter of not you know it's not a matter of of a, of a uh, an organ in the head in chomsky terms or a uh, an ideal in heaven if we want to put it you know like, i think again this the man in phaedrus who caught this you know glimpse of uh um, you know, of, of, of the truly existing intangible justice that exists in the realm of being. This is ma a matter, and that's a very platonic way of you know, thinking about it, you know, heavenly justice. This is a, a, an embodied justice that's grounded, and it is a matter of two people sitting down face to face, facing one another. Justice, as we're going to see, is about our relationship to others. And, it's, and, and, and this is why it's also linked to the idea of hospitality. Um, justice is then not something that not not an idea in heaven. It's rather how I relate to other people. Is my relationship with the other a jointed relationship? And for Heidegger, it's, it's sort of like a, 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 a joint or a hinge and a door. Is it one that's in joint or is there a disjuncture? Is it an out of joint relationship? Is it, is it one that's flown off its hinges? Um, and so uh, there's going to, we're going to see when we'll come back to this, but we're going to find, for instance, inspectors of Marx, uh, Derrida is going to be, you know, is going to criticize certain aspects of Heidegger's views of uh, justice, but, 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 but affirming this notion of justice as being linked to our relationship to the other as a matter of welcoming the other and, and hospitality. 
Um, now, but the same is true of Levinas, and we we, cannot, we don't have time to go into Levinas, but I will say in passing, he's a very interesting thinker, one definitely worth your time. He was effectively a student of Heidegger, but as, as, as a man who was Jewish, um, he, he became very critical of Heidegger because of his affiliation with the Third Reich. And so he, he, he uh, uh, wrote a very famous book called Otherwise Than Being. And so he, he attempts also to, to rethink the Heideggerian views of justice, uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, building uh, upon them and, 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 and being indebted to uh, Heidegger. So, so many contemporary thinkers uh, are. Um, okay, so here's from Adam, Adam X, uh, Ander Fragment. Uh, note too, you know, that, that with, the, with the sophists, or I, well, I should say not the sophists, with the let's say with the pre-Socratic thinkers, um, like Gory, like um, you know uh, Heraclitus and Parmenides and uh, Anaximander, um, that uh, uh, so much of their writing you know, is lost. And so it, it, to say that it's a fragment, it's not like a shard that was found in a cave somewhere. It's rather, you know, the pieces of these of these thinkers that were passed down through antiquity, antiquity because they were quoted by other people. But unfortunately, many of the original texts are, uh, are, are, are have been lost. We, we, we have nothing but fragments for in most cases. And so Heidegger is responding to this particular fragment by Anaximander. All right, and so in this uh, uh, in this uh, reading, and Heidegger does lots of these very careful translations, and his translations themselves are interpretations. And, and translation is a form of interpretation. It's a very important idea to the her German hermeneutic tradition, explored by figures like, say, George Steiner in his work after uh, Babel. Okay, but let's read uh, the literal translation of ADK is. Uh, Injustice. This would be the uh, DK is, is is justice. Uh, ADK is uh, uh, the negation of justice. Injustice. Uh, but is this literal translation faithful? All right. So this is how it's been handed down to us. But he's questioning this translation that's been handed down to us. If we resist our uh, juridical moral uh, notions, if we restrict ourselves to what comes to language, attend to the language itself, do this careful, close reading that he likes to do. Uh, as that Derrida likes to do, then we hear that whatever adike, that wherever adike rules, all is not right with things. That means something is out of joint. Okay. Um, that when we get to Specters of Marx, Derrida is going to quote, you know, Hamlet, uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet, where Hamlet says, "Time is out of joint." All right. So this is this is a, in reference to Hamlet, but it's also this idea here in. Uh, in Heidegger's. Um, all right, so the fragment, the fragment says, of Anaximander says, what is present as such, being what it is, is out of joint. To, to presencing, uh, presencing as jointure must belong, thus creating the possibility of its being out of joint. What is present is that which lingers a while. The while occurs essentially as the transitional arrival and departure. The while comes to presence between approach and withdrawal. This between is the jointure in accordance with that which, uh, that, uh, with which whatever lingers is joined. Presencing comes about in such a jointure. In the jointure, whatever lingers a while keeps to its while. It does not incline towards the disjuncture of sheer persistence. The juncture belongs to whatever lingers a while, which in turn belongs to the jointure. The jointure is order. Whatever lingers a while is inconsiderate towards others, each dominated by what is implied in its lingering presence. Beings which linger a while do not, in this respect, simply drift towards persistence so that they can still pre uh, present themselves as what is present. Read in this way, Heidegger says, the fragment now says, beings which linger a while, let belong one to the other, consideration with regard to the other. Okay, now I, I warned you that that would be uh, torturous, and it is torturous, but you have to kind of uh, carefully unpack what Heidegger is saying here. And I'm going to, you know, because uh, at, the, at the risk of over... Uh, simplifying because we've got a lot to cover in this lecture. I'm going to, I'm going to reduce it to saying, well, 
that, that, that one sort of shorthand way of thinking about what he's saying here is that a jointed relationship, one that is just, it's, it's, it is one that is a matter of my, uh, of my being in a, in a, in a jointed, uh, like a hinge in a door, in joint relationship with the other um, whom I allow to be the other whom one is. All right, now uh, uh, we could think of, say, questioning. Heidegger is also going to say questioning is the piety of thought. Questioning is, and, and Derrida is going to speak of this in terms of what, he, what he's going to call the uh, the zusage and he, the Heideggerian zusage is a term Heidegger uses, but Derrida is going to talk about in terms of uh, messianicity. But this is the, the 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 belief or the accord that's credited to the other, um, and in in uh, in Heideggerian terms, we think of questioning. If we if if we pose a question to the other, we must believe. That the other will speak the truth to us, and so um, uh, there's a kind of a you know it's it's it has there's a you know questioning is the piety of thought because we have to suspend uh, and give you know credit to the other and believe that the truth will uh, be forthcoming, but we never really know when we find it when we sit down across from the other we never really know uh, what what is going to happen in that interlocutionary exchange, because there's always going to be something that is beyond our ability uh, to, to calculate. And so, so the, this idea of, of justice or being in uh, the, the jointed relationship of a matter of letting be is, is, is me letting you be and your being, you letting me be and my being, and we allow each other to persist in the beings that we are, rather than, let's say, to put it in the sort of uh, conversionary evangelical uh, terms to sort of try to uh, make you another version of myself. No, I, I let you be who you are. You let me be who I am. Letting be is, is, is what is, is uh, just in a, in, a, in a jointed relationship. Okay, that's perhaps an oversimplification, but I hope it gives you uh, some, some uh, quick sense of what we're talking about here. Okay, now you can see here uh, image of hospitality from ancient Greece. Now Zeus was uh, the god of hospitality um, and all those who weren't hospitable uh, were punished by him. Of course, hospitality was the was was the rule of the ancient world. Uh, and uh, we know, for instance, that in the Trojan War, one of the things that sets it off is not just the great beauty of Helen, uh, who who runs off with Paris as the face that launched the thousand ships, but it's it's the fact that when Paris went into the home of Menelaus and Helen, he, according to the standards of the ancient world, violated. The hospitality, you know, of his host, and it's this. This is this is a grave uh, offense. We see we see uh, in the in the image to the left an image of uh, Odysseus, who's returned after wandering for many years to his home, where he finds the suitors besetting his wife um, Penelope, and acting very rudely in in his home in his absence. He disguises himself as a beggar, and they they treat him very uh, terribly, and then he ends up being slaughtered. Well, this is uh, uh, you know all those who who, who uh, violate the rules of hospitality are subject to these kinds of uh, very draconian uh, uh, forms of retaliation. Okay, so let's let's uh, review just a few basic concepts of justice to kind of keep in mind. Here we can say the anaximander for justice is DK jointedness and Heidegger's reading of it being in joint injustice would be a relationship with the other that's out of joint. Um, and for Heidegger, putting it in shorthand, we could say this is a matter of letting the other be, letting the other be the being that the other is. Uh, for Derrida, that's one problem with Heidegger's articulation is it's so uh, overtly metaphysical. Um, Spivak's going to put it this way. Uh, I heard her say this at a talk once. I'm not sure where it's written, but I, I have, this is something I heard her say that, that uh, she describes deconstruction itself as a matter of stopping short. And I think that uh, effectively sums up also what Heidegger's talking about is stopping short, let the other persist and being the other who the other is. Um, Levinas will very briefly describe uh, justice as our relation to the other. This is a definition that Derrida will affirm. Uh, and and uh, justice is a matter in Derrida of welcoming the other, of, of uh, extending a welcome to the other. Deconstruction is a matter of, of welcoming 
uh, the other. This is one reason why the, the comments of Peterson, Francis Jordan Peterson, that uh, Derrida is interested in the utterly corrupt pursuit of power is, is a total, um, totally false uh, reading of Derrida, it, not accurate in any way, shape, or form possible. It's simply, uh, it's simply a lie. It's a very dishonest characterization of Derrida's views. Either that or it's just grossly uninformed. Um, and, and Kant, as we're going to see when we look at uh, when we look at to eternal peace, he's going to put this uh, this very ancient idea from the ancient world right at the centerpiece of his uh, uh, you know universal human rights, and this is hospitality, which he's going to say is a universal human right, the right to be welcomed by the other. Um, all right, uh, Chomsky, as we've seen, is going to say justice is a hypothetical fluid in the brain. All right, uh, let's look at Derrida uh, on this. Uh, here's Derrida from a little book. Uh, it gives a nice little encapsulation of many of the basic ideas of deconstruction entitled Deconstruction in a Nutshell. And he's going to say, uh, uh, justice, if it has to do with the other, with the infinite distance of the other, is always unequal to the other, is always incalculable. Okay, so note there, in contrast to what we said with the, with the uh, Chomskyan view that, that justice is a matter of something that, that one calculates, that's a correct representation that, gets, that is calculable because it's, it's, uh, uh, the, it's lodged in the genome and it can be, uh, you know, correctly, it can be, a matter, there's a matter of moral uh, competence, but that implies that morality itself is, is, is calculable. Uh, like, uh, you know, language in the Chomskyan view. Uh, but um, Derrida is saying something very different here. He's saying, this is also linked to what he's going to call messianicity. What is, you know, what is, when, when the other, uh, you know, when we welcome the other, there's always something that is beyond our ability to calculate. We cannot calculate justice, he's going to say. He's going to say, Levinas says something, it says somewhere that the definition of justice, which is very minimal, which I love, Derrida says, which I think is really rigorous, is that justice is the relation to the other. That is all. Now, that's, that's a nice way of putting it. That's one nice uh, capsulation of, of the deconstructive idea, idea of justice. Justice is, relation, is the relation to the other, and that is all. That's why I said it's an existential definition. Again, I'm putting that word existential in, in quotes there, but it is a, it is a grounded, embodied uh, definition of justice it's about not it's not about ideals in heaven it's not about genomes in the brain it's about how i actually interact and relate to the other which is then therefore a matter of, of responsibility of responding to the other justice is in that sense also a matter of, of, of responding and being responsible to others and that is to say actual others um, who exist uh, on the planet earth as opposed to, uh, for instance, the Martian scientist in uh, Chomsky and thought he's always referring to this Martian scientist who inhabits some other planet. Very, very weird idea uh, to say someone like Kant, for whom uh, uh, justice is also a matter of, you know, you know, inhabiting this big round ball that we live on, the, the earth, where we all have to place our two feet somewhere. Okay. Uh, once you relate to the other as other, then something incalculable comes on the scene. And, and, and one reason for this is because uh, uh, we don't really know, since, since the, 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 the being of the other, the essence of the other is, is concealed from us. We don't know. I mean, wh whether or not one, if one accepts the idea that there are truly existing and tangible essences that we have the soul, uh, the soul itself doesn't disclose itself as such. And so when we sit down across from the other, we don't know, uh, you know, we, we don't know the intentions of the other. We're not able to read the mind of the other. Uh, we, we have to uh, uh, give credit to the other. We have to uh, uh, give, uh, we have to believe that the other uh, will speak the, the truth to us. Um, we have to suspend our uh, hostility uh, to the other. And um, uh, it's because we're faced with something that we just that is that is, in, that is uh, incalculable. That's 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 beyond our ability to uh, to calculate. Okay, well, give me give me a, 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 an image of this. Um, 
here is uh, um, uh, Derrida has a really interesting reading on hospitality. He takes two words. Derrida often will coin a new word by taking together two words and bringing them together. And this word here, hospitality, is is a, a, a bring a coming together of two different words, hostility and hospitality, which becomes hostitality. And he he like he talks about this in Spectres of Marx in reference to the Abrahamic. He discusses it elsewhere, like for instance, in, instance in Acts of Religion is another place that you can go to learn about hospitality, also in um, the politics of friendship. But you can see on the left there, there's a there's a painting of uh, it's, uh, and Christians will call this the Old Testament uh, theophany um, of the uh, well, it's when three of these visitors uh, come to visit uh, Abraham. It's very important whether you're Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. This is a central uh, uh, story uh, because, and of course, you know Abraham is 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 the prophet of hospitality, much like Zeus is the god of hospitality in the Hellenic tradition. So he's He's a figure noted for his hospitality. And in the biblical text, uh, the book of Genesis, he welcomes these three visitors into his home, these three angels who, who, who reveal to themselves uh, after he offers them hospitality, their, uh, their divine nature. Now, um, when Abraham uh, welcomes them, he has no idea who they are. They could be, you know, people that are there to, uh, you know, rape his wife and plunder his home and kill him. He doesn't know, and one can never know when the uh, when 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 the visitor approaches whom the visitor is. This is why you know it's that that old famous saying, you know, you be careful, you know, when you know, maybe angels coming to your knocking on your door. Uh, well, in the, in the image to the uh, to the right, you can see a, a painting of the uh, burning of Sodom and Gomorrah, because what, the, the only way you can really effectively understand the story of the three visitors who comes to see Abraham is by uh, juxtapositioning it with what with what follows, and that's that the visitors then go to the home of of, of Lot, the nephew of Abraham, and there the 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 men who live in the town seek to uh, rape them, and uh, you know so they they sh that which is the precise you know opposite of uh, hospitality, and and Lot you know says well look you know I can't you know I I will give you my uh, my virginal daughters, but 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 please. Uh, you know, uh, don't mistreat the guests who are in my house. This is this is an imperative for the for the host who welcomes the visitor is to protect the visitor with his uh, life. Um, and so here we have a kind of a, a, a replication of what we saw in the earlier image of um, of the story from the Odyssey is that those who violate hospitality, the law of hospitality, will pay a very severe uh, price. But but the, the bringing of these two words together is I mean, etymologically, of course, they're they're both linked to the word host, and they're uh, it's nice. I like the way he puts these words together because it does emphasize the amb ambiguity, the the incalculable nature of the encounter with the other. Because the other, when they sit down across from us on on the rug and we, uh, you know, uh, exchange uh, discourse with them. I mean, we never really know what, what could happen in that exchange. There's always the possibility of, of the outbreak of violence. But Abraham, uh, unlike the, the, the men of uh, Sodom, welcomes the guest. And as a consequence, uh, uh, they, they tell him that he will have a son born to him. This becomes uh, Isaac. Um, okay. Um, well, I, I think uh, we, that uh, will conclude our review of this question of differing concepts of justice. And I would like now to uh, move uh, more into the question of the social contract and, uh, and particularly with respect to uh, the way that Rousseau is going to articulate this in his uh, book, The Social Contract, which is a key founding text in Republican thought. Um, but I, I, there are other thinkers of the social contract and of sovereignty. Um, Derrida is going to, the, the one thing that he does say about Chomsky, the one criticism that I'm aware of, the only place that I've seen where he actually ventures a criticism of Chomsky is when he says there's a lacking of, of, the, of thinking of sovereignty in, in Chomsky's thought. It's an interesting observation. But th these were all thinkers of uh, sovereignty. 
And uh, you can see there uh, Boudin on, uh, on, on the far left was one of the early thinkers of sovereignty. So you can see the dates there, it was 1530 to 1596. And then Hobbes from Thomas Hobbes, famous author of the Leviathan from 1588 to 1679. Uh, John Locke, uh, 1632 to 1704. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1788. And then of course Kant follows uh, Rousseau. So there's a kind of a direct uh, generational, we can see generationally what happens to the thinking of sovereignty and the social contract as, as time goes by. Well, unfortunately, we can't look at Locke and Boudin. Uh, briefly, though, I would say about Hobbes, um, he's such a, 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 an important figure. Everybody should know about Hobbes, and maybe uh, all of you already do, so I'll keep this brief. His most important work is, of course, the Leviathan. Um, and I'll just say quickly here that he's, his, he's a very pessimistic philosopher. Uh, he, he, artic he thinks of the state of nature as a brutish, uh, terrible uh, place where it's the, the, the anarchistic, uh, you know, uh, law of no law prevails. And, he, and this is, he's, uh, as, as we see here, I'm saying one of his quotes, famous quotes is, the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And he also famously says, both sayings are true. Man to man is a kind of God. Man to man is an errant wolf. Uh, and so he's the one that, you know, says you better lock your doors at night because your neighbor is, is a wolf. And one of the reasons why we need a social contract, we need laws, is to protect us from the dangers that our neighbors inherently pose to us, given the fact that man is a dangerous and dynamic creature who's capable of doing great evil. So it's a, you know, Hobbes is a, is a pessimistic uh, thinker. Um, and so uh, his, his view of the state of nature and of anarchy is not a, uh, is by no means a one that he celebrates. Uh, anarchy is, is, is a matter of mayhem, uh, chaos, and anything. Is, man, essentially, in Hobbes's view, is capable of, of anything. And so this is why we need laws. This is why we enter into social contracts or covenants in the view of Hobbes. So he's a very pessimistic thinker. And I wanted to just briefly review that before we went to Rousseau, because uh, with Rousseau, he has a more uh, optimistic vision. Now, Carl Schmitt, who wrote the concept of the political, published in 1932, which we're going to read uh, uh, also, um, it, he lived, as you can see here, from 1888 to 1985. He famously said, security is the cogito ergo sum of the state. And he, like Hobbes, was a, he was a, a realist, perhaps the, one of the key, along with Machiavelli, one of the key uh, philosophers of, of, of what's known as political realism, along with Hobbes as well. Um, and he's going to also suggest, as we'll see later, that you can tell, you can figure out if you want to understand people's where they're coming from politically, you can just one the, the, the key question to ask is how do they what, what do they view the nature of of man to be now uh, for Hobbes as as also you know for Schmidt who was a Catholic uh, you know Christian who believed in the inherent you know the sinful nature of all people uh, man is 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 a essentially as you can see here in the image on the left a kind of a dangerous and dynamic creature. There's the wolf man, a kind of a wolf at your door. And so you have to be really careful about your neighbor. Um, on, on the uh, right, by contrast, you get when we get this idea that comes out of the Enlightenment is very popular in the 19th century, following uh, the teachings of Rousseau, is that man is a kind of, in the state of nature, is a kind of a noble savage. And this leads to all kinds of strange conceptions about uh, people living in non-European uh, societies who who are imagined to be these uh, like in the, the perhaps in the American literature the most famous instance of this is James Fenmore Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans who who uh, gives us sort of this competing image of uh, of uh, Hunkus and Magua Hunkus being you know, the last of the Mohicans who was sort of an archetype of the of, of the Rousseauian noble savage and Magua being a kind of a, a figure that has a kind of a demonic energy, but is a, but is a, a, is is also an embodiment of, of a kind of a natural evil. Um, 
So uh, Rousseau, though, is, is, is far more optimistic than, uh, than, than uh, Hobbes. And in his discourse on inequality, also you get a, a, a stronger sense of this, that people in a state of nature, human beings in a state of nature, are, are inherently good. And, it's, and, and we get in discourse on inequality, this notion that it's, it's precisely society, it's civilization that makes us corrupt. But in our own natural condition, we are, we are very, we're essentially good. And this is also leads to, you know, Rousseau's thinking of education, like in Emile, that his thinking of children as being, you know, naturally uh, innocent, which is a very different idea that, that is handed down from Christian culture. We think of, for instance, in uh, Augustine's, uh, 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 confessions, he's going to say, well, if we think of, you know, children who, um, you know, if we look at two twins and they're both uh, nursing from their mother, the, the, the twin who is, has a full belly because he's, got, he's gotten all the breast milk that he needs will still cry when he sees his brother drinking uh, from the same breast, not because he isn't uh, satisfied, he's already full, his natural physical needs are met, but he's simply jealous, uh, envious. Uh, and this for uh, Augustine offers evidence of, of the inherently sinful nature, this sort of Pauline doctrine, big sin, big salvation, which is, in, which is very prominent in the Catholic and Protestant uh, traditions as well. So uh, the, the realist view is that man is inherently sinful, inherently evil, the view of Hobbes and Schmidt. The Rousseauian view is, is more optimistic uh, view of man in a state of nature is, is good, but it's society that corrupts us. Okay. But nonetheless, in this more uh, mature document that Rousseau writes, The Social Contract, Rousseau is seeking to account, you know, why if, if, if man in a state of nature is good, why then do we leave the state of nature? All right. And here's what he says. He says, force is a physical power. I do not see how its effects could produce morality. To yield to force is an act of necessity, not of will. It is at best an act of prudence. As soon as man can disobey with impunity, his disobedience becomes legitimate, as the strongest is always right in a state of nature. Uh, the only problem is how to become the strongest in a state of nature. Since no man, Rousseau says, has any natural authority over his fellows, and since force alone bestows no right, all legitimate authority must be based on covenants. Now, now note here, uh, when we use this word uh, covenant, um, that um, uh, that the covenant is a uh, um, it, it's an oral version of the contract. So when we think of covenants and contracts, so a covenant is an oral oral agreement with the other. A contract is a written agreement with the other. So the counterpart. Of the uh, of the contract uh, of of the written contract is is the uh, is the covenant and the and the counterpart of the vow is the um, would be the the signature and this is going to become a, a, a deconstructive Derridian theme as well we'll encounter it when we read uh, the ear of the other is this idea of of the signature so the signature is what marks the social uh, contract when in its written form. The vow or the oath is, is the oral oral counterpart. Let's say the oath is spirit, uh, aspirated spoken breath. The, the, the signature is uh, the inspector. It's the written uh, contract. Okay. Um, uh, excuse me, just one second. Technical glitch here. Okay, so to continue... Uh, he says, uh, again, uh, all more, uh, legitimate authority must be based on covenants, which is to say agreements with the other. So here we're thinking about the relationship with the others. We've been talking about justice being a matter of a jointed relationship with the other. And yet that relationship has to be established on, again, the key here. Uh, is that these covenants have to be actually articulated, okay, like we talked about with respect to the maxim. This, this is a really important point because a maxim is an actually articulated law in, in the external empirical world. It's not a vague principle uh, that, that is uh, hypothetically asserted to be in the brain. It's not a heavenly ideal in heaven. It's, a, it's an empirically external, actually articulated law. Now, 
it could be written, which would be a spectral articulation of the laws in a Mac, but a maxim could be oral oral. But if it's a spoken word, it still assumes an empirical uh, and external uh, character. And so a covenant is is not a vague, I mean, a law that, that a covenant that, 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 that is, is a matter of, of a contract that we establish. We, we, if we form laws with uh, that, we're, that are going to be binding upon both of us in a contract, um, then uh, it can't be just some vague notion I have because I don't know what you're thinking. You don't know what I'm thinking. We have, we have to write it down or we have to speak it to one another, then swear an oath in the presence of another. Um, uh, and it has to be, it has to be a word that comes out of my mouth. The vow is something that I speak. Okay. In the same way that a signature is something I put in a contract. This is empirical, external. It's not a vague uh, other elsewhere. Okay. It's, it's in the actual world of, uh, of, of uh, becoming, to put it in, in platonic terms. Okay. So Rousseau says, I assume that men reach a point where the obstacles of their preservation in a state of nature prove greater than the strength that each man has to preserve himself in that state. Beyond this point, the primitive condition cannot endure, and then the human race will perish if it does not change its mode of existence. Okay, so uh, there is, I say that this is a bit more mature work than uh, the discourse on inequality, because he's not simply saying here that civilization corrupts, he's saying something very different. He's saying, no, you know, uh, if we want to sustain ourselves, if we want to even, you know, survive, we don't want to perish as, as a species, uh, then, you know, we better change our way of doing business. And we have to, uh, you know, we have to uh, construct laws that are binding upon us, uh, that, that bind both of us, which then is going to imply the, the necessity of the use of force. OK. Um, all right. So. Uh, force in terms of the enforcement of the laws that we establish between ourselves, as we'll, as we'll discuss momentarily. All right, so Rousseau's going to say, and this is a really key passage in the social contract in book one, chapter six, and it anticipates the Kantian categorical imperative. As I said previously, Kant, you know, takes many of the ideas of Rousseau and brings a certain conceptual rigor to them. But what we find often in Rousseau is very similar to what we find later in, in Kant. And here what Rousseau is saying is very similar to what Kant is going to say with respect to the categorical imperative. Okay, he said, here's Rousseau. How to find a form of association which will defend the person and goods of each member with the collective force of all and under which each individual member, while uniting himself with the others, obeys no one but himself and remains free as before. This is the fundamental problem to which the social contract holds the solution. So in effect, um, a, a law, if, if I erect a law, then I'm, 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 I'm establishing a prohibition. A law is, is a matter of, of a prohibition or a limit that I'm placing on my own behavior that I will not transgress. And as Freud is going to uh, observe, we only place laws if there are on, on, on we, I mean, we don't need to make laws for things that we don't, uh, uh, don't naturally want to do. For instance, there's no law that says you cannot put your hand on, in, on, on a burning stove. We don't need a law for that because we know it would hurt if we did it. So we only need laws for those things that we, we, we might be inclined to do uh, if there weren't laws. And so a law is a matter of, of, of a prohibition that I place upon myself. And so the question is, how do I, what, you know, what laws can we articulate that I'm willing to place a prohibition upon myself and yet still enjoy an experience of freedom? And so we're going to see that the, the, the liberty in the, in, the, in the enlightenment as it comes out of, you know, Rousseau and figures like, you know, Kant, is, is not anarchy by any means. It's, you know, we've left a state of nature. We live in a state of law. But, and so, and so we gain freedom, but it's freedom within the law. And that's really what liberty means. Liberty is not anarchy. It's freedom uh, within the law. But, but, but if I'm going to experience this freedom, it's because I, my will, I'm willingly placing this limitation on myself or I embrace this uh, limitation in order to experience freedom. So I get something in return by entering into a social contract. There are things I don't get. I can't just you know, break into my neighbor's house and steal his goods whenever I feel like it. I have to agree to place limits on my own behavior. 
Uh, but I get in return for that, I get something as Schmitz can say, one of the main things you get is, is security, of course. All right, so the categorical imperative then, which we've already looked at, act only according to that maxim, whereby you can at the same time will that it becomes a universal law. And so I know Kant underscores this word maxim uh, because it's a matter of some, it's a matter of, of a, a principle that has to be articulated. And if you can, if you can do this, then you will, uh, you'll find yourself uh, enjoying an experience of, of freedom, but freedom within the law. Okay, uh, uh, let's continue with Rousseau. He's going to say, what liberty do we gain from the social contract? And so one of the things we're going to see Rousseau saying then is that even though effectively, unlike Hobbes, he's, he, he still doesn't recant his view that he says in the state of nature, we're still essentially good. He remains that, he, he, he retains that essential optimism, but he's going to say by entering into a social contract, um, we, we become better, we become more virtuous. He's going to say the passing from the state of nature to the civil society produces a remarkable change in man. It puts justice as a rule of conduct in the place of instinct and gives his action the moral as actions the moral quality they previously lacked. It is only then when the voice of duty has taken the place of physical impulse and right of desire uh, that man who has hitherto thought only of himself finds himself compelled, uh, excuse me, finds himself compelled to act on other principles and to consult his reason rather than his inclinations. And although in civil society, man surrenders some of the advantages that belong to the state of nature, he gains far greater ones in return. What man loses by the social contract is his natural liberty and the absolute right to anything that tempts him and that he can take. What he gains by the social contract is civil liberty and the legal right of property in what he possesses. We might also add that man acquires with civil society moral freedom, which alone makes man the master of himself. For to be governed by appetite alone is slavery, while obedience to a law one prescribes to oneself is freedom okay so you can see here how Kant is is essentially responding almost in a direct way to to what rousseau says here um but i want to note here too so what what rousseau is essentially saying is that that is that what we what is that because we become attentive to our duties to others and this becomes you know Kant becomes the ethical philosopher of, of of moral duty and he's getting this uh, also from rousseau uh, what, what we gain is by, by being aware of our responsibilities to others, uh, we become better ourselves because we become more uh, virtuous. We're we, we, uh, this, living in, uh, in, in civil society and adhering to the social contract makes us better people. It makes us virtuous people. And so we're, we're, for Rousseau, we're, we're, we're good in a state of nature, but we become uh, even better in a... Uh, uh, in, 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 in society once we embrace the social contract. Now, I want to note here too in passing that um, that this idea of virtue, which sounds uh, uh, somewhat, you know, in the, in the era that we live in today, it seems almost, you know, quaint, this idea of, you know, virtue. Well, virtue uh, for the Enlightenment thinkers and many who frame, for instance, the ideas that we that are handed down to us in the Constitution is, is what the, uh, is, was what is definitive of the relationship between citizens in the social contract. And so it's very akin to this idea that we saw in Plato when he's talking about, um, you know, philosophy as we said, philia uh, sophos or the brotherly love. Philosophy is a matter of brothers gathered, to, brothers who love one another gathering together in the pursuit of, of, uh, of wisdom. Um, here we have, you know, the, the citizen is essentially, you know, construed as a kind of a brother. And, and the love of brother for brother is what Rousseau is calling virtue. He's going to say the, so, the, that a republic cannot uh, survive unless there is virtue uh, within it. Now, that, that may seem quaint and archaic today. And, vir and virtue then is akin to what you know, Plato is calling you know, philia in, um, uh, in, in, in uh, the uh, uh, in, in, in Phaedrus. And so uh, which is one of the reasons why we get in the early days of the, uh, you know, of the Enlightenment or let's say the French Revolution. This is more, this is more evident, for instance, in France, you see this carved in stone everywhere. It's less uh, evident in, in the American context, this idea of liberty 
equality and fraternity. So fraternity is a matter, you know, brotherly love and the love between citizens should be in, in this Rousseauian system is a matter of the love of citizen for citizen, which he calls virtue, which is very similar to the love of brother for brother. And, and, and again, he's going to say that no republic can survive unless uh, unless there is virtue uh, within it. So that's I think that's something that's worth our uh, being uh, aware of, because I think there that that uh, there's ongoing you know relevance to that question today. OK, um, so let's note here, too, in passing, uh, we'll come back to this when we read Carl Schmidt. But the Republic, the res publica means, you know, it's the public thing that is conjured uh, by the social contract. Conjure, I mean, conjure literally from the Latin means to swear together or to swear with. And so um, in forming the covenant, the, 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 uh, the brothers, for instance, the, in this fraternal uh, model, uh, swear together. And in doing so, they, they conjure into being the res publica. And if you look very carefully at this image, which is the, from the cover of Hobbes' uh, Leviathan. A Leviathan is a kind of a monster, a monstrous entity. And it's what, in fact, what they bring into being is a monstrous entity. And we'll come back to this inspectors of Marx because uh, Derrida is going to do this reading of, of uh, Horatio, Marcellus, um, and, uh, you know, Hamlet when they, they gather together and when they speak the name of the, of the king, the king uh, appears uh, before them. They conjure the king into being. And so this is what happens in Republican ideology is that uh, what, it, by, the, by virtue of swearing this monstrous Leviathan, uh, this image of sovereignty is brought together. Now, if you look very carefully at this image of the sovereign Leviathan and from Hobbes's Leviathan, you can see that the, that the, that the one sovereign is made up of a lot of little individual bodies you can see there within it. So this is also sort of one of the paradoxes of Republican ideology is that it's 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 a it's one, but it's a it's it's a one that's made up of many. It's out of you know, out of one many. This is even I think inscribed on our uh, dollar bills. Um, okay, um, so uh, uh, this is the paradox. There's another paradox inherent in, in Republican ideology besides the fact that the one is construed as the many, uh, and yet. Uh, Rousseau is going to claim that uh, sovereignty is indivisible, and yet, you know, we know that it is divisible uh, since it's made up of many different individual entities. But um, this is where this is a, uh, something that uh, is going to become uh, paradoxical and uh, interesting to reflect upon, since you know all of us uh, who are at least those of my those of you who are taking my uh, course anyway uh, uh, inhabit a republic if you're American. A citizen, you belong to a liberal democracy with the Republican Constitution. Um, uh, and so uh, here's Rousseau. Let's read what he says about this. Every individual as a man may have a private will contrary to or different from the general will that he has as a citizen. His private interest may speak with a very different voice from that of the public interest. And fancying that the artificial person, this res publica or monstrous leviathan, which constitutes the state is a mere uh, fictitious entity, since it is not a man, this is not a real man, but a prosthetic man that, that, that we create. In other words, you know, in this system, you know, God creates man, but man creates the Leviathan, man creates this pros prosthetic res publica. Uh, he might seek then to enjoy the rights of a citizen without doing the duties of a subject. The growth of this kind of injustice would bring about the end of ruin of the uh, or ruin of the body uh, politique or the res publica. Uh, if 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 anybody just did whatever they wanted, like for instance in the novels of the Marquis de Sade, where you have these rogue figures who who deliberately spit upon the uh, social contract. Uh, hence, in order. Uh, that the social pact will not be an empty formula. It is tacitly or unspokenly implied in that commitment, which alone can give force to all others, that whoever refuses to obey the government uh, shall be constrained, uh, the, the, excuse me, whoever uh, refuses to obey the general will, which would be the, in the government, uh, shall be constrained to do so by the whole body, which means nothing other than that he shall be forced to be free. And this, this is the paradox. If you don't want to belong to the 
uh, res publica. If, you, if let's say you say, well, I wasn't there when they when this when this swearing ceremony took place, when this entity was conjured into being. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's not optional for me. I have to. I am being forced to be free, and this may be something that I. I don't, maybe I don't want to belong to it. Well, it's, you don't have a choice. Uh, you know, Locke's going to say something uh, similar to what um, Rousseau is saying. That in Locke, he's going to say, "Well, it, it would be as if a uh, a man is on a horse and he's he's galloping down the road, and you know that up ahead there's this big ditch, and if he keeps going." He's going to fall into that ditch and he's going to die and the horse is going to die. And so you constrain him, you force him, you say, no, you can't do that. He may think that he wants to do it, but it's not in his interest to do it. And so really, even though you're using force, uh, you're doing him a favor. But, but for our purposes, too, we have to note that the law itself is, 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 uh, is, is not a law unless it is backed up with force. And this is a point that Kant's going to be make as well. Uh, it's going to make as well, which is that a law that, that can't be enforced is no law at all. So force, the idea of force is itself uh, interdependent with the law. There's no way to uh, think of the law without thinking of the, of the enactment of, of violence and, and force. So it's in this sense a kind of a duty to, to enact uh, violence uh, in, in, in any uh, republic. Anywhere there's a law, there's going to be enforcement of the law. Um, now, this is one of the reasons why Nietzsche is going to say Kant's categorical imperative reeks of cruelty. This is from the genealogy of morals because he's he's underscoring uh, the 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 uh, uh, the implicit fact that violence will uh, uh, necessarily be used to back up the categorical imperative, uh, uh, the, and which seems so uh, noble. It's nonetheless, there's there's no way to get around this question of the necessity of the use of, of force in in, uh, uh, in backing up the law. Okay, so uh, um, I want now uh, we we we've talked now about Rousseau's social contract. There's a lot more that could be said. It's a really interesting book. I urge you to read it. All this like his discussion of the lawgiver, where the laws come from. Um, which is going to link to, in a very sort of Augustinian, uh, uh, Neoplatonic way to the idea of the laws that are inscribed on the fleshly tablets of the human heart, um, the law inscribed on the, on the human interior. Which, so he's going to end up back in a very kind of a Platonic formulation of this question of the origin of the law. We, but we don't have time to go into that today because I want to focus on what Kant's going to do with the social contract to get us to thinking about this question of teleology and, um, and, and, and progress and, 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 and how Kant is going to try to, you know, take this idea of, of how, you know, um, we are compelled due to uh, the circumstances that we find ourselves in, you know, to leave a state of nature, enter into social contracts or covenants. Uh, but then these various res publicas, these republics that are conjured into being will inevitably find themselves in conflict with other Republics, republics uh, that are out there, and he's going to say, "Well, because they're, they they live in close proximity to one another, and so there's going to then, therefore, inevitably be a need to form, you know, covenants between the various res publicas, and this is going to lead to the idea of a of a united uh, nations or league of nations, which comes out of uh, um, this this essay on uh, to eternal peace, and and which leads him to contemplate, you know, the possibility." of, of uh, establishing a kind of a world uh, in which there no longer are conflicts where we live in a relative state of, uh, of harmony and peace or what he's going to call to, or, to eternal peace, which would effectively be the end of history if we were to achieve this. Okay, so there he is looking a bit Gollum-like. Kant was not a very handsome fellow, as you can see, but very brilliant fellow nonetheless. Uh, Towards Eternal Peace was written in 17... 95. Okay, so let's look at his, let's look at the, some of the language from this essay. He's going to think about a kind of a Republican utopia. All right, by the way, uh, when I use these words, you know, Republican, uh, it's important to, to try to distance themselves from how they're used in contemporary discourse. It certainly doesn't mean that Kant would have voted for Trump or Biden, either one, or Bernie, whoever it is that's running. It's, it's that he, he is, uh, he's thinking of Republican in the idea of the Republic in, in conceptual terms. All right. Um, so he's going to say the sole established constitution that follows 
from the idea of an original social contract, as we've been saying in uh, Rousseau, the one on which all of a nation's legislation must be based is Republican, right? So there's no way out of this for Kant. Uh, for first, it accords with the principles of the freedom of the members of a society as men. As far as the matter of right is concerned, republicanism is the original foundation of all forms of civil constitution. Okay, so, but we're going to see too, when we get to, uh, uh, you know, Marx, we start thinking about, you know, socialism, the socialist mode of production in Marxist terms, um, that, that, uh, uh, that, that one of the key refrains of, you know, Marx is this idea of the internationality or the international, you know, uh, league of, of workers. And so Republic, uh, the, the kind of Republican ideology being articulated here by Kant is one that, that was, that was uh, not embraced in, for instance, in the Soviet Union, which never declared its, uh, its borders. And so uh, uh, socialist, socialism, socialist ideology tends to be more, you know, inherently international, not even international. I think it's not the right word because that still implies the reinscription of the idea of the nation, but let's say post, post-national thinking, like what, what would the world look like without republics, without nations? Well, this is not something that Kant, this is not, Kant's not willing to go there in his own thought. I don't think he even thought the thought. He's just saying, he's saying here that, re, that the Republican constitution is, is, uh, uh, inevitable and and effectively, this is also what Hegel. This is the position that Hegel is going to end up in, and he'll, so his idea. Both Kant and Hegel have a different idea of what the end of history look would look like than say you know Marx, um, who's who's sort of a post Republican thinker. Um, okay, uh, thus the only question um, remaining is this: Does it also provide the only foundation for perpetual peace. So, so it's inevitable. Republican ideology is inevitable. There's no way out of it. But does this, uh, does the constitution of nations as republic provide a foundation for the possibility of, of an eternal peace or perpetual peace or a world in which w wars have ceased? Uh, the Republican constitution, he's going to say, does provide for the desirable result, namely perpetual peace and the reason for this is as follows. If the consent of the citizenry is required in order to determine whether or not there will be war, it is natural that they consider all its calamities before committing themselves to so risky a game. OK, so in other words, if you've got a sovereign uh, who's, who's just a king, he may on a whim decide, you know, that he's going to get into a war with this or that country. But if, if the consent of every citizen is, is required, then people are going to really care more carefully and reflect upon whether they want to actually go down the path of war. Uh, from the throne of its moral legislative power, uh, Kant's going to say, reason absolutely condemns war as a means of determining the right and makes uh, sense, and, and excuse me, makes seeking the state of peace a matter of unmitigated duty. And so all of us, if we exercise our reason, if we're thinking properly, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're going to do everything we can to avoid uh, war. Uh, but without a contract among nations, peace can be neither inaugurated nor guaranteed. A league of a special sort must therefore be established, one that we will call a league of peace. All right. So again, uh, first, uh, the United Nations was first in its first incarnation was the Kantian League, a league of philosophers following the teachers of Kant. Then it became the League of Nations. Then it, it mutated into the uh, United Nations. But all of them are there, you know, following sort of this notion that Kant establishes that um, we need to have, you know, contracts among us so that we can guarantee, uh, you know, uh, the possibility of, of peace. Um, and so um, I'm not going to get into today the problems with the with the sort of uh, fallacious nature of the construction of the UN today and how it is uh, about uh, are, you know essentially a bastardization of the ideas of Kant because it doesn't really follow uh, very closely the teachings of Kant. I it, mean, it, it's established on Kantian ideals, but it, it's been gerrymandered uh, on, and on, on behalf of particular nations against the interests of other nations. We will set that aside for a minute which, because we're just trying to understand what Kant is saying here. So Kant's going to say, reason can provide related nations with no other means for emerging 
from the state of lawlessness, which consists solely of war, than that they give up their savage, lawless freedom. Okay, leave a state of nature, anarchistic state of nature, uh, to enjoy experience of freedom within the law or liberty, just as individual persons do. Okay, so nations, so he's saying here, what happens between you know different people when they give up their freedom and uh, give up their anarchistic freedom in a state of nature and they enter into covenants and they experience freedom within the law? Well, the same can happen between different uh, established republics uh, if they adhere uh, to this common these, these covenants that they establish among themselves and by accommodating themselves to the constraints of common law establish a nation of peoples that continually growing will finally include all the peoples of the earth and will thereby lead to this uh, uh, this this uh, you know end of conflict end of history that uh, that that he is uh, he's thinking of in terms of what he's calling here perpetual or eternal peace okay uh, there on the uh, on the left you see the emblem 1919 of the League of Nations and then then the, then, then the United Nations logo that we have with us uh, today okay so uh, let's now okay we started with the discussion of, of justice and hospitality which we said was central to the thought of of, of, of uh, Heidegger and Derrida and uh, Levinas and many other contemporary deconstructive theorists. It's a very old idea. I think uh, there's in, in some places Chomsky will say, "Well, these uh, all these all these uh, sophisticated intellectuals in Paris, they think they've discovered all these new things." Well, uh, you know, there's nothing. <laughs> there's, they're not really working. These are not new discoveries. These they're, they're, the, these are thinkers who are who are who are thinking about concepts that are very very. Uh, old. They, they haven't invented really anything new as much as they've been thinking carefully about the ideas that uh, f that they've that have been handed down to us historically during the history of philosophy. And hospitality is certainly one of the oldest ideas that comes to us from uh, antiquity and, and through Kant to the modern period that we live in today. Um, all right, so Kant's going to say with when he, what he's calling cosmopolitan right, our concern here is not with philanthropy, but with right, uh, it's not a matter of, of charity, but this is a right that everybody has, the right of hospitality. And in this context, hospitality, hospitableness means the right of an alien not to be treated as an enemy upon his arrival in another country. This is the main number one universal human right. Uh, if it can be done without destroying him, uh, he can be turned away. Uh, but as long as he behaves peacefully, he cannot be treated as an enemy. He may request the right to be a permanent visitor, which would require a special charitable agreement to make him a fellow inhabitant of a certain period. But the right to visit, to associate, belongs to all men by virtue of their common ownership of the earth's surface. For since the earth is a globe, they cannot scatter themselves infinitely but must finally tolerate living in close proximity because no one had a greater right to any region of the earth than anyone else the right to the earth's surface belongs in common to the totality of man okay so uh there is a really crucial point and i would I'd like you to just pause on that for a minute and focus on that this idea this cosmopolitan right because the world is this big round ball and we live on this big round ball. And as inhabitants of this big round ball, we got to put our feet somewhere. And so rights are linked, you know, sit, the question of citizenship, for instance, is linked to the question of residency. Where do you place your feet on this big round ball? And I like, I love that definition of citizenry and, and, and hospitality and linked to the question of hospitality, because again, it reinforces this idea of what I've been calling sort of this existential notion of justice being a matter of our relationship to the other. So if we, if we all, inhabit this earth and this is our existential condition we find ourselves uh you know uh, in, in a situation in which we are related to the other and we are responsible uh to the other and this is this is uh, the the basic uh an unavoidable uh plight that we find ourselves in this is our basic situation this is also why i find it really uh, you know, strange and weird when 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 someone like Chomsky, who claims to be a champion of justice and 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 human rights, is always referring to 
this idea of a Martian scientist. Imagine you're a Martian scientist living on this other planet and looking down on these lowly earthlings here. And at one point he even says as, as a, a scientist might look at a fruit fly under a, a, a microscope. Well, we don't live on the planet Mars. We live here on this planet. And so justice is a matter of my responsibility and my relationship to, to real other people, actual others on this planet. And this is what Kant is talking about. And this is why he says cosmopolitan right, the right of hospitality is, is linked to the fact that we all inhabit the same planet and reside in the same place and must place our feet somewhere on this big round ball. Okay, so, so those are really key passages, very important to focus on. And they are reiteration of what we've been talking about linked to questions of, of DK, justice, hospitality, uh, justice as relation to the other and the deconstructive thinkers that we began our lecture with today. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, the idea of cosmopolitan right is not fantastic and exaggerated, but rather an amendment to the unwritten code of national and international rights necessary to the public rights of men in general. Only such amendment allows us to flatter ourselves with the thought that we are making continual progress to perpetual peace. All right. So with this right of this cosmopolitan right of hospitality needs to be affirmed because it is only in that way that we will make progress to, fight, to, to reach this final goal of perpetual peace or end of history where we no longer are beset with endless uh, wars. Okay, so now let's think for a minute about what it means to be a progressive, okay? And, and Kant, we might say, is, is sort of the father of progressive thought, right? So, so this, these are real key passages, particularly for those of you who like to think of yourselves as progressive. So what does it mean to be a progressive, okay? And here's what's, as we're going to see what's somewhat paradoxical in this formulation is that, a progr that, is that the, the Kantian idea of progress is also linked to the question of conflict, okay? So progress happens through conflict and in effect through war. And so we're going to find Kant uh, saying that, there, that there, are, there are good things that come out of warfare. The warfare, as terrible as it can be, can, can lead to progress, okay? Now we're also going to see as we look carefully at this that Kantian thought here is, is also indebted in some sense to Leibniz again because Leibniz is the thinker of providence, but he's going to re- tool the Leibnizian idea of providence to become progress. And so one way of thinking about this is that in Kant, um, uh, progress is, is a more, let's say, secular articulation of providence, which is, a, which is a more expressly theological way of thinking about what Kant is talking about here and what Leibniz is talking about this idea. I mean, I think of, for instance, in Scarlet Letter by Hawthorne, you know, when, when, uh, uh, Hester Prine has to wear this A and she suffers for, as being an adulteress. She suffers for many years by being by being stigmatized by having the scarlet letter uh, uh, embossed on her address. But in time, she begins to see God's providence, that there was a plan. God had a plan for all this. And so uh, she, she comes to accept her situation. And we see this is this the idea being that, you know, that, that despite the fact that we suffer, um, and, and like, for instance, in, in the case of war, war causes great suffering, but it le but, but there's, we have to trust that, that God has some plan uh, 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 and, and is the author of history. Um, Kant's going to have very similar idea, but he's going to call providence progress and he's going to call God nature. And this also, of course, raises the question of how nature becomes a kind of a, a, a God term. Uh, and to, I say Spivak might say in, in Kant's uh, discourse here, because he he uh, uh, he, he places this uh, this concept in this sort of godlike uh, position in his discourse. OK, uh, so what is a pro what is progress? What is a progressive perpetual peace is ensured, guaranteed by nothing less than the great artist nature. So each time you see nature, you can insert the word God if you want to think about it in Leibnizian terms. Uh, whose mechanical process uh, makes her purposiveness visibly manifest, permitting harmony to emerge among men through their discord, even against their wills, right? So we may not want harmony, 
but nature's got a plan for us and she's going to make sure that we that, that it comes to us if we re if we reflect on nature's purpose purposiveness in the flow of world events and this is kind of weird to think about does nature have a purpose for us think of this for instance compare uh, stephen crane's famous little poem a man said to the universe he said a man said to the universe I exist and the universe replied, well, that doesn't instill in me any obligation to care about you whatsoever. I'm paraphrasing it, but it's the same kind of idea does is nature indifferent to us or does nature have a purpose uh, for us? Uh, Kant's view is that it does uh, and regard it to be the underlying wisdom of a higher cause that directs the human race towards its nature, towards its nature's objective goal and predetermines the world's course. We call it a uh, providence. This is again from Leibniz. We can think of Leibniz's principle of reason. Nothing is without reason. We've talked about this in terms of reason being a ground, but here just this idea is everything happens for a reason. And the fact that this is so is, is, is what Leibniz calls uh, providence. Okay, so we said Leibniz's providence becomes Kant's progress. Leibniz's God becomes Kant's nature. When, as in the context of this essay, Kant's essay uh, to uh, eternal peace, our concern is entirely theoretical and not religious, it is most appropriate to limit uh, to the limits of, using, of human reason to use the term nature. Uh, for in reflecting on the relations of effects to their causes, human uh, reason must remain within the bounds of possible. Uh, experience okay so he's again this is this Kantian move of sort of bracketing off uh, the metaphysics bracketing it off the theological saying that's appropriate for private discourse but in public discourse we can't really talk about God's plan we can't talk about providence it's more appropriate to talk about nature's plan and and progress okay and I would note here for those of you coming to Kant uh, for the first time his book Re, uh, religion within the bounds of mere reason is not a bad place to start. Uh, this this text is one of the more accessible texts that can give you, particularly if you're coming to Kant from a religious orientation, it can give you pretty clear um, idea of many of his concepts and, and as they are applied to religion and come out of religion in many cases. Uh, the term nature is less pretentious, uh, let's say, than the term God. And then a term connecting that there is a providence of which we can have cognitive knowledge, okay? Because we don't have cognitive knowledge of God, unlike in the way that Descartes claims, because God doesn't position uh, himself within the empirical ex external framework as an object that can be perceived. So we we can only believe, okay? Or you can see quoted below this famous quote from the Critique of Pure Reason, where Kant says, "I had to do away with knowledge to make room for faith," okay? Uh, so on which we can take, when which we take we flight as on Icarus's wings in order more closely to approach the secrets of some unfathomable uh, intention. All right, so we have to be more humble. We don't know in the way that Descartes claims that we know. In taking care that men could live everywhere on earth, nature, okay, and Leibniz has turned God, has uh, terms God, has also despotically chosen that they should live everywhere, even against their inclinations, and without presupposing that this should rest on a concept of duty that binds men as a moral law. Instead, she, nature, has chosen war as a means by where, by, uh, whereby this purpose is to be fulfilled. Okay, so that's a very interesting uh, comment and you know again we, you know if you think of yourself again as a progressive I uh, note what he's saying here um, that even war war can war as terrible as it is can lead to progress but the reason why he's not really celebrating war as much as he's saying that war because it is precisely because it is so horrible can like our, our condition in a state of nature which also uh, would have been terribly horrible, you know, when the law of, of anarchy prevailed, the law of no law, and the strongest, you know, might makes right was the, was the order of the day. Well, uh, the experience of war can then compel us, he's saying, to, uh, to, to establish covenants with one another to ensure that these wars come to a conclusion. Okay, now here we find also in to eternal peace, really the the seeds of Hegelian uh, dialectics, um, uh, as, or what in Hegelian thought is you know, called spiritedness or the desire for recognition or 
the desire for a desire, which is phimotic uh, uh, impulse. Um, Hegel's not going to take this platonic turn and call the, the thymus. This, uh, he's not going to think of it in these metaphysical terms that we find in uh, Phaedrus uh, or in Timaeus. But it's, it's a similar notion of, of the thymotic. Um, uh, Van Glar is another way of thinking about it. Um, I like to use the figure of, of Achilles from uh, the founding uh, text in, the, in Western uh, literature is, of course, uh, Homer's Iliad. And, 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 and Achilles is, is the main figure in that text who's there in Troy, not because he cares a fig for Menelaus and his uh, you know, feelings for his uh, wife, Helen, or even because he's outraged by the Trojan, uh, uh, you know, uh, violation of the law of hospitality, uh, but rather he's there because he wants recognition of his of his worth. He wants the glory. He's there for to glorify himself in his own name. Uh, war itself, uh, says, requires no particular motivation, but appears to be ingrained in human nature, thymus, at least called in platonic terms, and is even valued as something noble. Indeed, the desire for glory inspires men to it, even independently of selfish motives. Consequently, courage in war is judged to be of immediate and great worth, not only during war as is reasonable, but also in order that war might be. And often war is begun only as a means to display courage. Okay, and so there we have again images of Achilles. Some from one from antiquity, one from the Renaissance, one from a contemporary film. Uh, but in all cases, uh, Achilles he's 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 really a, a central sort of figure. Um, and and uh, if you want to uh, begin thinking. Uh, in, in Hegelian terms, he might be a figure to kind of focus on. Go and watch this film, Troy, for instance, and focus on the figure of Achilles, and you can get some sort of sense of what uh, Kant is talking about here. Okay, so Kant says, when I say of nature that she wills that this or that happen, that does not mean that she sets it out as a duty that we do it, because only practical reason, which is free of constraint, can do that. Rather, she, nature, does it herself, whether or not we will it. So, so again, he's putting, uh, you know, she, nature, becomes, again, a kind of a God term or, or what, uh, a kind of a transcendental signifier. And this might be something to think about. Uh, those of you interested in deconstruction, you know, what is a transcendental signifier? How does nature become a kind of a transcendental signifier or God term in Kant? Well, we'll come back to this idea as we get more deeper into the questions of deconstruction. Uh, even if a people were not constrained by internal discord to submit to public laws, war would make them do it. For every people finds itself neighbor to another people that threaten it, and it must form itself into a nation so as to be able to prepare itself to meet this threat with military might. Now, the Republican Constitution is the only one that is wholly compatible with the rights of men, but it is also the most difficult to establish and still harder to maintain. Yet the mechanism of nature can be used by reason to promote and secure the nation's internal and external peace. The desire of every nation is to establish an enduring peace, a perpetual peace, an eternal peace, hoping, if possible, to dominate the entire world. But nature wills otherwise. She uses two means to prevent people from intermingling and to separate them. Differences in language and religion, which do indeed dispose men to mutual hatred and to pretexts for war. But the growth of culture and men's gradual progress toward greater agreement regarding their principles leads to mutual understanding and peace. In this fashion, nature guarantees perpetual peace by virtue of the mechanisms of, of men's inclinations themselves. Okay, so, um, well, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, and you can see there that Kant is, uh, uh, you know, despite what he's saying about the necessity of war and the, uh, the inevitability of war, that he's finally a progressive thinker, but he's, he's construing as, as progress through conflict. And so as we look at questions of dialectics, what's called dialectics in, in, in Hegel and Marx, which evolves out of this Kantian uh, view, 
we can see that history and, and Hegel, Hegel's the philosopher of history, Marx too is a philosopher of history, and, and they're going to have significant disagreements, but they're both going to agree that, that, the, that the motor of history is conflict. They're going to disagree over what the conflict is about, but, but conflict is at the heart of, of, of history, and history is a matter of progress. And so we, we, we get progress, we're moving forward, we're moving to a better place. You know, Marx is, is a utopian thinker, uh, Hegel's a utopian thinker as well, but it's, it's a utopian that we reach a telos, an end, a goal, that we reach only through conflict and only through uh, progress, which also implies, again, um, the inevitability of, of, of violence between uh, uh, the other uh, will uh, enact violence against the other in these uh, terrible uh, wars that, that have beset us uh, from the beginning of, the West, of, of, of Western history with uh, Homer's uh, Iliad, which it comments on. I, you know, again, I, I really urge you to, if you haven't read the Iliad, read the Iliad. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, I, I would say the Iliad is to a Western a, a European civilization what, uh, you know, the biblical text is to uh, uh, the Abrahamic traditions. It's, you know, you, you've, you've got to be familiar with it. Okay. So again, so key philosophers, Kant, Hegel, Marx, they all affirm progress through conflict. We'll turn our attention to uh, Hegel and Marx. In the next lecture, uh, you can see there, if you look at the dates, however, Kant 1724 to 1804, uh, Hegel 1770 to 1831, Marx uh, 1818 to 1883. We can again see this sort of generational question, how one generation responds to the other and how the thinking of one comes out of the thinking uh, of, of the other. Okay, so where we'll, where we'll go next, we'll also, we'll talk uh, further about the questions of end of history, teleology, messianicity, uh, which will contrast with messianism in the Abrahamic traditions when we get to specters of Marx, and we'll look at these thinkers of progress, Kant, Hegel, and Marx, and we'll also talk about Fukuyama's end of history and the last man and Derrida's specters of uh, Marx, where he discusses messianicity. So uh, that uh, concludes this, uh, this lecture. I thank you for your patience. This one's been a little longer than the other ones, but we are making definite progress, and I look forward to continuing our discussion. We're finally getting to the place where we can really begin to engage in a more direct way some of these uh, deconstructive thinkers at the center of our uh, study.